So the title of this lecture is Thematic Cartography and Geovisualization. We're going to see geovisualization as a term. Uh, it's a, a nice geo-geek term. Uh, and geo-geek is just a language that we speak in geography and cartography. Uh, and so most of anything that we're going to be creating in this course is a geovisualization. But think of those as anything from uh, a 3D map, uh, an AR sandbox, uh, or maybe virtual reality uh, cartography. So those are kind of some cutting edge stuff that maybe we'll dabble in a little bit later on the semester. So geovisualization, really not going to specifically talk about that in this particular lecture, but all of this particular content is essentially visual geography, which uh, of course is now a cool buzzword, uh, geovisualization. All right, so when we think about cartography, it's also important to keep in mind that we are map makers. We are bringing with us our own bias. And so that we, get, we think and view the space around us or our world uh, and how we then map that world, uh, it varies from person to person. So what I've done beforehand is I've said, okay, students, I'd like to see your cartography skills. Draw campus. Uh, and so when you look at this particular map of someone who drew IEPY's campus, you can see the things that are important to them. They're obviously interested in the sporting uh, uh, stuff, uh, the basketball, uh, the, the soccer field, the softball. Uh, back in the day where there was a 24-hour McDonald's that they were obviously someone uh, probably visiting that 24 hours. So they're, they're very specific in terms of the things in their, their mental map or their view uh, of campus. That might be different than this particular person who's, you know, a little bit more straight to the point, uh, you know, not as detailed. Uh, and so there's someone who's uh, uh, probably just a biker. Uh, you can tell, you know, the bike rack. Uh, they, they, they know where the bike racks are. They know the routes. That's all they care about. Uh, and so we think, you know, how they visualize, how they, in this, in this case, interpret their world is, is quite different than, let's say, a person who, obviously, this one here is a commuter, uh, in which they are very much uh, uh, kind of uh, concerned about cars. Uh, here, this is an interesting one, the, the old hot dog lady. Uh, I hope she's still around. Uh, but the hot dog lady, man, that was so much good food there uh, back in the day as I taught in the lecture hall and walked to Kavanaugh. But uh, it's kind of this, our view of place. And so this particular lecture, you know, what makes it different uh, than what say that might be in the, uh, the textbook reading or, or out there is I'm gonna add kind of my uh, perspective. And that's obviously what a lecture is all about. And so here are the elements that every good map must have. Every map must have these elements. It's to be a, a good one, a title, author, date, source, legend, or a key, a scale, and a north arrow or compass rose. And here is a great map in which it has all those elements. We have title, we have author, we have date. Date's important. Uh, you know, maybe a map might be made in the 1970s, and that's why you know a country like Eritrea or South Sudan doesn't exist. Uh, the source of the data. Now, this isn't always you know going to be uh, you know something we can you know, put on there. We can't put it maybe every element on every map, but this is you know a full map should have these elements. Over here is the uh, legend or key. Uh, this is the north arrow, also known as a compass rose, and then this is a scale. Uh, so this is a map that contains all the good elements of the map. Here is a great map, man. This is really cool. Problem: no title. Well, well, what are we looking at? I mean, this is an interesting pattern, perhaps, but I don't know what I'm looking at because there's no title. And so I'm going to go through some examples of uh, some maps that need uh, these elements. Uh, when I refer to scale, uh, <clears throat> these are the different types of scales. Uh, there's a graphic scale, which you actually see on the map, uh, a written scale, which essentially just writes it out and says, you know, okay, one inch on the map equals 20 miles in reality. Uh, and then there's also a representative fraction uh, scale. And that's kind of one colon to a large number. And so what that is, is one whatever on the map is related to 20 million of that in reality. For example, let's say I take my marker uh, and I put my marker on the map and say, okay, here's one marker. Well, I can then go, you know, in reality, uh, that distance from the end of my marker to the other end is if I would go in reality onto the actual surface and do flip it over 20 million times, and I'd go, eventually I get to uh, uh, the other end of the marker in reality. A representative fraction, we're going to see more of those in digital maps, in interactive maps. 
uh, whereas the graphic scale and the written scale are ones in which you're going to see more in stationary or paper maps. Here's a great map that shows where uh, the reception of the wedding is. So it's got a great, it's got an, uh, uh, a legend, a key. It's got uh, north arrow, so it's got compass row, so I know which direction I'm going. The problem is it doesn't have scale, and so there's no scale. And so I was in a particular wedding in which the main street was like one minute here. This was like about a 30-minute jog. And so it makes it seem like, well, wait a minute. Based on this map, this is the same distance because there's no scale and it wasn't made to scale. Uh, this was actually just a one mile and this was a 30 mile uh, distance. And so it was looking for Elm Street for a long, long time. Uh, another one here, this is kind of, you know, when we think about what's, you know, what would be missing here is the north arrow, the compass rows, and that's useful for orientation. Here's a map of uh, of metropolitan Indianapolis. It's accurate. All the places are relatively uh, related to each other and then the highways and all of that. But the problem is up is down and north is south and uh, we got to flip this sucker around. So the north arrow is useful. So if someone out of town, you know, they're, they're you know, like a tourist, which the city has a lot of, they would get in a, a place, a, a map of, of the local area. It better be accurate in terms of its, you know, its orientation so that the person knows, okay, I expect up here would be north, down here, south, nothing like here in which uh, this would reverse. All right, let's get to some good PowerPoint stuff here. Uh, so we're going to use some terms uh, throughout this semester. And so one of the terms we're going to come across is thematic map. Uh, and so we are going to create maps that have data. Uh, and so a thematic map is a map that depicts a geographic pattern. I emphasize geographic because, you know, that's what makes this stuff, you know, that's why this is cartography. It's got to have a geographic component. I know that's obvious, uh, but I just want to emphasize that right off the bat here is, is if we have data, it has to have some type of geographic uh, identity, something geographic about it. Uh, in terms of geo-Greek language, we use the term attribute. Uh, that's kind of a, a, you know, another term for data or maybe a variable or a theme. Uh, so I got plenty of examples to follow. Um, so essentially the moral of the story is thematic maps, which is going to differentiate them between another type of map, a reference map, is these are maps with data. Uh, maps that actually are uh, going to visualize outcomes of processes. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use another key term, Features. So we have attribute, which is essentially data or variables or themes, whatever. And then we also have features, and that's going to be elements of a map that we're going to create. So to differentiate a thematic map, once again, it has data. So the map on the left here uh, is employees and mineral industries. And so you can see uh, the counties are what we're showing here. And the mineral industries, we can clearly see based on the size of these circles, uh, are down here in this particular area of the state. So this is a map that has a theme, mineral industries, and it has data, uh, data in which it's been obviously quantified way back when. This is just a general reference map. Um, so we might create general reference maps and they're, they're definitely gonna be a key part of cartography, uh, but these aren't gonna be thematic maps in which they have a theme or data. I mean, they guess they do, they have roads, the networks and all that kind of stuff, but they're just more purely for reference. And so we are gonna create reference maps and you know we've seen these before. A political map just like this is a great example of a reference map. And so in cartography, oftentimes these reference maps where they're useful is something called a base map, B-A-S-E space map. Uh, so this is the underlying map in which we're going to create on top of that uh, our cartographic elements. Uh, and so the base maps are going to be kind of the uh, something which we will use reference maps, uh, but also uh, something we'll we'll see uh, in ArcGIS a lot of. Uh, and so another type of base map is a satellite imagery. Google Maps. You know, this is this base map here. Uh, this is another example of a reference map. All right, back to what is a feature. Uh, so a feature in cartography is a representation or a symbol, or some way to show a location or a phenomena. Uh, so when we think about location, you know, we have various types of features that can represent a location. We've got, of course, continents, and we got countries on continents. We've got states in a country. We've got counties and states. We've got cities and counties. We've got roads in a city. We've got townships. We've got block groups. And so when we think about a location type of feature in geography, they're limitless. Uh, so that's a blessing and a curse. Uh, but in terms of features in geography, we're going to show them uh, in different ways. Uh, but 
think about a point. A point kind of has no dimension, of course, a zero dimension. Uh, and so it just showcases an exact location. So a point might be exactly right where you're standing right now uh, or sitting right now uh, would be a point. Uh, but if we get a look at Indianapolis, if we're kind of showcasing Indianapolis on the United States map or a North American map, we would show Indianapolis as a little point. Uh, you know, but if we zoom in, of course, we would see that Indianapolis is a big, large metropolitan area. Oftentimes, when we think about lines, those are going to be like road networks or anything that shows paths. Uh, so line uh, is, is something that represents a location feature. Polygons. So polygons are going to be any type of area. And so we see the term polygon, so don't get so much focus on that. Think of polygon as any geographic shape, perhaps one that maybe we're familiar with. Uh, that's supposed to look like Indiana there. Uh, and so think about states, counties, townships, block groups. All of those are examples of polygons in which they have an area. So when we think about cartographic elements in terms of location and how we represent them on a map, point, line, polygon are the terms we use here in cartography. Now let's talk about some features that represent phenomena. And so these are going to be things that, once again, uh, we can tie to or connect to geography. Uh, or location. Uh, and so features that represent a phenomenon, temperature at a weather station. Uh, and so a weather station is a particular point. Uh, and so we can over time measure temperature. Uh, and so we can see temperature over the course of a day, over the course of a year, and so on. The area of a block group, the size of a block group. A block group is a census definition of a particular geography that's very, very small. Uh, it's much smaller than a county or a township. We can then, from that, investigate the number of infant deaths in a block group. Uh, so we can do health type of research where we think about, okay, we have this non-geographic thing, infant deaths, in a geographic area and try to investigate, well, why there? Uh, number of accidents in a county, another way in which we can think about types of features that represent phenomenon, accidents. Voting preferences, uh, not going to really go there. Uh, crime incidences, so we can look at crime. And so in, in a GIS class, we can maybe kind of come, come up with you know, a, a, a way to show uh, how many crimes occurred within a 100 uh, a foot buffer around a, a cultural path or a, a bikeway. We can essentially then quantify that and show that. Uh, so that phenomenon being crime incidences. All right, another thing we're going to see is something called an attribute table in geography. So with this, uh, for some of you, uh, this is redundant if you took a GIS class already, but some of you never have taken a GIS class. And so this is something when we, I want you to kind of start thinking, how do geographers think? Uh, and we view the world as an attribute table. Uh, and so an attribute table, essentially think of it as just a big old spreadsheet. But it must have, once again have that geographic or a spatial. Uh, we're going to see the word spatial. This is essentially it's the same thing as geographic. This is interchangeable. Uh, and so a geographic it must have something geographic. And so here is let's say you know all kinds of data or attributes about a particular location, uh, and that location is. The address, and so there has to be something geographic. It could be latitude and longitude. It could be an address, uh, but nonetheless, there has to be a geographic component to uh, the data. Uh, but we see, you know, all this non-geographic stuff in included as well. And so, just imagine a spreadsheet, uh, or if you've ever been used Microsoft Excel, Access, or anything like that. Start thinking, okay, that's how we think in geography. And so let's go ahead and use some examples. Uh, and so here, let's take one attribute over time. It could be anything. Uh, let's say just population. Uh, and we can study it over time. And so we store this in a table. Uh, and so we have different geographies. We could say these are diff uh, different counties or different states. Uh, and so we can then have over time one attribute, let's say population, uh, so we can see over time many geographies. And so this is you know, how we store it. This is an attribute table in which this is the objective here. Another objective might be different, uh, in which we have many attributes, uh, so many different variables, many different geographies, but one snapshot in time. And so uh, we could say, okay, this is all county data. 
Uh, this is infant mortality. This is population growth rate. This is death rate. This is birth rate. Uh, so we have many different attributes that could be stored in a attribute table. Uh, but once again, the geographic component here, uh, we have the many geographies uh, for this one particular time. Another example would be one which we have many attributes. Uh, so once again, our very variety of data, infant mortality, birth rate, death rate, uh, over time for a particular geography. And so we don't see right here geography we don't see anything uh, in either of the axes here but but we think of it as okay we're referring to one place and so this could be indiana in which we have all this data for indiana over time or johnson county uh, all the various data over time another way to kind of think about attribute tables uh, and this is one in which i am more interested in commuter patterns uh, and so the origin and destination table. And so the idea here is we'd say we have different counties, it could be any geography, uh, could be different cities. Uh, and so where do people originate? Where do they live? And where do they go to work? Uh, and so do they live, let's say they live in region one and work in region four. And then so essentially would say it's at 150 people. And so we can get an origin and destination table. And this is very useful for traffic flow. Uh, for, for commuter, for, to, to any flow of anything, really. I mean, anything in which there's an origin and a destination to it. Uh, so this kind of a vi vi way to visualize this, this is from stats.indiana.edu. Where do Adams County residents work? And so this is all this is, is this is a table in which they have, okay, Adams County. All right, and so then they, you know, get all the data. Okay, well, this is where they live and this is where they work. And so then that's essentially what we have shown here. Uh, and so then this is a proportional symbol. This is in which we have, uh, of course, most people in Adams County, they, they live uh, and work in Adams County, but then also nearby Allen County is a, a source of a lot of, 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 of uh, workers as far as where they go. That makes sense. This is the big city. And so this, once again, all of this, this is a map, all of this in which it's basically just an attribute table. That's what it's based off of. That's the purpose of this discussion pretty much right there. Uh, all right, let's move on. Now let's look at, okay, Let's look at some actual some data and actually go to Excel uh, where we can see attribute tables and actions. And so here what I have is I have two different maps that are using the same data set. Uh, but I'm just essentially, okay, what is the purpose? What am I trying to show? Uh, and so let's say I want to show, you know, I want to show where th things went down uh, in the last decade. Where did, where did the population decrease? If, I, if that's the concern there, then the, the objective, then you can see the map on the top. But the map on the bottom, let's say I want to see what's the general pattern in the state of Indiana. And you can see clearly uh, the counties that are around Marion County, uh, particularly the, to the north and to the west, are where we see uh, population growth over uh, from 2010 to 2020. And so if I go back, I created this in Microsoft Excel, very simple. And all this is, is once again, geographic component. It's got to have something geographic and the data set percent change. And we see this is essentially a map. This is all this is, is based on an attribute table. This one created in Excel. The other one, all I did was just find, okay. I just did a little bit of massaging with the data, which is a part of a part of, uh, of cartography uh, is, is working with data and kind of perfecting it. And, you know, measuring twice before you, you make the map. You know, really going and making sure uh, that, you know, you're doing what you're trying to do here. And so in what this case was, I was trying to show all the counties that had a negative number. Uh, and so to, to do that, I just kind of said, okay, well, I'm going to code these all one. I'm going to insert this particular uh, 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 column. Uh, and then essentially all of these are then going to have the value of one, which then this map created by saying, okay, all the blues are going to be ones and then the null or the nothing uh, or, or should be shown in gray. And so that's just, once again, trying to emphasize how we think in geography, how we think in tar cartography, we think in terms of tables. Uh, we think of columns and rows, um, at least for now. Uh, we'll see if the, you know, the paradigm will shift uh, o over time. Uh, a thing I found, found you know, from the book that was very, very useful, uh, and it's something I want to emphasize is the, uh, the kind of the workflow. I like this because, you know, the map making process, just like, you know, for, for those of you who are artists, it just, the process never ends. It just kind of, you just continue to, to, to design and redesign and evaluate and critique and, uh, and so on. So same thing with regard to cartography. And so when we think about this workflow, first off, we just, you know, we have to think about, okay, what is our objective here? 
Uh, and so we have to kind of think about the world. And once again, that's where I introduced those maps at the beginning, kind of, you know, how do we view our space? How do I view uh, our world? Then we determine the purpose of the map. Okay, what are we trying to do? Uh, and then it's the money part, collecting the data. Uh, that's the hard part. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we all want to create a map of, of everything. Uh, we all have this, you know, I, I want a map uh, where everyone eats ketchup. Um, you know, that's, that's hard to do. Uh, it's you know, tough data to collect. And, and probably what you're going to show is you're going to show me where people are. And it's, it's really, so you have to think about okay, what are we trying to do here? Is this relevant? Is this purpose? Does this have a useful purpose? Is this something which I can actually find out uh, or create? Uh, then we get to the part where, you know, we emphasize in this course is the designing of the map. Uh, so this is really kind of the em emphasis of this course in which we kind of constantly, we can see this feedback here in which we design and we, we produce, we publish, we evaluate, we critique, we have a help from others. And so that's really what I'm going to emphasize in the rest of this course is uh, this part of, uh, of cartography. All right. So, you know, when we think about designing the map and collecting the data, we have to make some key considerations. And so the key considerations when mapping, there's, I would say, five of them. And so first off, what type of map? Uh, what type of map are we wanting to create? Then next up is choosing a map projection. And this is something that's more uh, going to be useful when we're thinking about big uh, you know, maps. When we're looking at maybe the globe, uh, when you're kind of looking at size of area. Map projection is going to be more important. Uh, so it's not always important for every particular uh, uh, map, but uh, it's something definitely to consider. Uh, next up is simplify. Uh, so I'll just keep it simple. Uh, next, choosing a map scale. Uh, so we think about this is how much we'll be zooming in or zooming out. Finally, what's the aggregation? Uh, that's just, are we looking at the county level, state level? Uh, what kind of data do we have? I'll go through each of these with some examples. All right, types of maps. And so going at what type of map, we have four different types of thematic maps. First off, a choropleth map. Next up is a proportional symbol. Also, you see uh, referred to as cartograms. Next up are dots, uh, dot maps, and then finally isoline maps. And so here is a choropleth map in which it's showing in the different geographies, it's showing data in which it has it categorized. Uh, so a choropleth map, we see different shaded areas. And so this particular theme is alcohol consumption. Uh, so we can see red areas where we have higher alcohol consumption and in green areas where consumption is lower. Choropleth maps we're going to see a lot in, uh, in, in dem, you know, demogra uh, demography. Uh, uh, we're going to see them in political maps. Uh, so a lot of things that involve uh, humans, uh, data regarding, uh, you know, uh, voting behaviors. Uh, so a lot of maps that you see, choropleth maps, uh, are, are also from the United States Census as well. All right, so that's the choropleth map. This is a cartogram or a proportional symbol map. This shows the world population, I believe, at zero uh, AD, um, I, I believe. Uh, and so you can see that most of the world's population was there in uh, the Eastern Hemisphere. This is before the, uh, of course, the um, um, large uh, migration of, of people to the Western Hemisphere uh, via forced or uh, voluntary reasons. Uh, next up here is, speaking of forced migrations, is uh, kind of a proportional symbol map that shows flow. Uh, and so it shows the, uh, the Atlantic slave trade, and it shows where people went from uh, the different parts of, of Africa to uh, the Me uh, Americas. And so the proportional symbol would be uh, areas in which you see the, the largest uh, flow uh, of that forced and mass migration. Here's a video. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a video that shows uh, a proportional symbol, but also a choropleth. And so what's showing is a uh, choropleth uh, would be the uh, the kind of the mood of people, uh, and then the uh, size is how many people are tweeting. Uh, so this is the pulse of the nation. So essentially, green uh, would say that these people are happy, uh, and there's a large number of them tweeting because they're kind of waking up. Uh, now they're waking up in the Pacific uh, since it's 12. Uh, people are working. People don't like working. People are tweeting about how they don't like working. Uh, and so there you can see you know, this definitely shows the lo uh, very small population of the Great Plains because a few, few people tweeting. Uh, but then now people are getting happier uh, in the South. 
uh, the East Coast here. Are they getting happier? Is the workday in? Same over here now. Now they're getting tweeting about how happy they are. Uh, now that the end of their day, but nope, we're going to bed, working late, still uh, still up late, not happy. Uh, so you can essentially see how this is a new or different geo uh, visualization uh, that takes a proportional symbol map and combines it with a core plot. Like, oh, look how angry we are. We're angry here. Um, next up is a dot map. And I like showing this because this is a, uh, uh, you know, back in the day when I used to teach in large lectures, uh, this is the pattern as far as where people would sit. Uh, I don't do assigned seats. I'm sure people still do that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so there'd be this pattern which you'd have a kind of a dot. Uh, representing everyone so there would always be that one student always that would come and sit right in the front uh, so everybody else sits in the rear everyone else is by, up by back by the exit uh, everyone wants to you know get in get out uh, but there's always that diehard it always sits row one seat one right there in the front but this is kind of a way to visualize uh the pattern from above and that's very part of cartography and part of map, map you know the whole idea of map making is we often are viewing the world from above uh, whether it be those those previous maps I've shown, you know, we're looking at the aerial view. And so this kind of thing of this is the aerial view. And this is a very key part of cartography. And when we do dot maps, what we can do is we can look at density and concentration. So 1960 NASCAR races, high concentration here, uh, high density uh, here in uh, this part of, of the United States. Whereas in 2000, a much uh, lower density because there's fewer races. Uh, but also a lower concentration. It's more spread out, more dispersed. Uh, so that's kind of a, the usefulness of dot maps is measuring uh, concentrations and densities. Uh, and so the ultimate dot map is this particular map here in, uh, from the previous census in which they made a dot for every single person uh, in the United States. And so if you zoom in real close, you'll see yourself. You'll see yourself as a dot. Uh, unfortunately, this map is no longer available, so you can't do that anymore. But uh, uh, this here is a dot map on steroids. Uh, here it combines a dot map and a choropleth map, uh, stroke depth. Uh, so stroke depth is shown in purple. Uh, and so the uh, yellow are areas that are stroke centers. And so you can see there's obviously a problem here in which the stroke centers uh, are, are far or are too, too uh, far of a distance from the people who need it. And so this is kind of where, you know, you can kind of find these maps. And of course, once again, uh, this isn't the, you know, the most slickest cartography, but still uh, it's useful in which it says, huh, maybe we should do something here. Uh, this is an isoline map. And so this is a map that shows uh, all points along a line are the same value. And this could be whether temperature, uh, could be uh, uh, water. In this case, we're showing elevation. So this is uh, right there along uh, our campus. Uh, so this is the White River. Uh, so we can see it's what, 675. So all points along this line is 675 feet. And then here, this is 700. So all points along this line is 700. Uh, so we take that around and down and around. And so all points along a line, uh, an isoline have the same value. And we think of that, this particular base map that we often will use is uh, this type of uh, elevation map. Uh, it's useful for many different ways. Uh, but this particular map is essentially is a good example of an isoline map in which all uh, particular areas, let's say pixels uh, of this computer uh, or the, of this particular screen that you're seeing or viewing this from uh, are the same value. And so this is way high elevation and then the green would be low elevation and so forth. And so you can see the ruggedness of different parts of uh, the surface. Same idea, this is an isotherm map. So the idea here is, okay, all areas in here that are super duper red are uh, 80 degrees annual mean temperature and then the areas that are uh, blue are in the 20s and so forth. Uh, this is an isohuet map in which it shows rainfall uh, using isolines. Next up is projection. There's going to be a future lecture where I've sp uh, we'll spend more time on uh, projection. Uh, but this is just a, a cool thing I saw from Twitter way back when. Uh, just kind of different ways in which we kind of how things are distorted. And so that's one of the things is every map lies to you, especially if we lose the kind of these global level maps in which they're distorting something. Uh, it's impossible to get something that's round, our Earth, and put it on a flat piece of paper. And so there's always going to be some way in which the map is skewing something. And so here is the human head and how the maps uh, are changed, essentially the projections change or distort, a, so, so to speak, a round person's head. Our next consideration to keep in mind when making a map is simplify. <clears throat> the idea there is just omitting, uh, you know, keeping, uh, 
emphasizing, just doing all whatever it takes to get your point across, you know, whatever you're trying to convey as a cartographer. And so a good example of this is a guy named Harry Beck, who came up with a better way to visualize the tube system or the underground uh, train system there in London. So this is the previous. And so the idea here was, uh, you know, when they made the map, they're like, geographically accurate. The cartographer was probably patting himself on the back saying, you know, I did a great job making this geographically accurate uh, map of the uh, of the train stations and, and, the, and the flow and all of that. The problem was, it wasn't super useful for the riders. It kind of was kind of overlapping. The places where they meander kind of was confusing. And so Harry Beck came up with a better idea, a simplified version of the previous map in which you just focus in on, okay, what you need to know when you're riding the train. You need to know where does it go and where does it stop and the key places it stops. You really don't care about the geographic accuracy. Is everything based on uh, the perfect location? It's not uh, important. So this is just a way to kind of visualize or understand simplification. I like this one. This is, I don't know where I came across City Lab. looks like there on the bottom, right? Uh, these are the major rivers of the United States. And so it's kind of a good way or interesting way to think about the rivers uh, and their flow. Uh, and so one of the things is that when you see this, you know, maybe you don't realize how much the Gulf of Mexico gets uh, the internal uh, drainage and flow uh, from the internal uh, rivers and, and such from deep within the interior. Now let's do map scale. Uh, and so we've traditionally thought of elections uh, as states, red state, blue state, and all of that. But if you really know elections, uh, they're one at the very much at the local level. Uh, and so oftentimes it's particular uh, census tract uh, or a county will actually be where uh, things uh, sway. Uh, so we look at Indiana. Uh, we're not going to talk about the results. We're going to just, we, we don't go there. Uh, it's just kind of, you know, it's just not an issue I like to talk about is politics. Uh, but I do like talking about the maps. Uh, so let's talk about the maps. Uh, so here's an interactive map uh, in which we zoom in. Uh, now we're zooming in. And so we've changed the map scale. Uh, and so when we think about map scale in our case, kind of in this modern age, we think of it as zoom in, zoom out. Uh, but map scale used to be kind of more, do we look at things at the, you know, at the state, uh, you know, as far as our, our reference, or do we look at the, the nation? Uh, so when we think about map scale, that's kind of more zooming in and zooming out. Uh, so it's a key consideration because we don't want if we're, if we're studying, let's say, Indianapolis voting patterns, we don't want to make a map or, or, or have this be uh, what we're showing or what we're emphasizing. Uh, we want Indianapolis patterns would zoom in and would show Indianapolis. And so that's the level of zoom is when we think of scale. Aggregation is different. Aggregation is based on the data. And so when I say, what are we going to aggregate? What's your aggregation? Uh, so a lot of this is based on whatever da data you have available. Uh, but are you using county data? Are you using state data? Are you using township data? Are you using census tract data? Uh, are, is your data too uh, you know, specific? Uh, if you got the household level, uh, there's some you know ethical uh, problems with that. When, when we don't want to show houses, we don't want to show individuals uh, in some instances because of just privacy issues. And so the you know we're going to talk about that throughout the semester, kind of these ethics keys things to kind of keep in mind when we're making maps. Uh, you know re regarding uh, you know you know geoethics or you know we don't want you know people's information. We don't want to break the rules uh, when we're making maps, but we want to create maps to definitely. Uh, you know, inform. Uh, and usually we try to find the most detailed level data available. It tends to be the best because we can always aggregate up uh, the data. Uh, so for example, we can take all the data from all these individual census tracts and then aggregate it up to uh, Marion County, uh, to the county level. Uh, so when we think about aggregation, we think more about the data uh, going kind of aggregating up or aggregating down uh, to a more defined, detailed uh, uh, geography. Whereas map scale is more kind of the, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, there's the element of the map that, you know, the whole graphic scale, written scale, representative fraction. But when we think about scale, we think about just zooming in and zooming out. All right. So that's uh, kind of just some, uh, some key considerations, uh, some kind of key things to think about when making maps. It's introducing some key terms like attribute table, features, uh, and, and all that thematic mapping. Uh, so hopefully this is uh, informative to kind of get us going, a good introduction uh, as we get ready for uh, actually making, making maps on our own. So if you have any questions about this lecture, you can email me at b-a-k-e-r-a-n at iupy.edu. I'll be more than happy to, to 
to c- continue this discussion. Uh, so if you have any feedback to offer, uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to hear it. Uh, and so hopefully we can, through this semester, uh, have a good discussion, uh, whether it be on campus or online.